All right, well, good evening. It's welcome, everybody, this evening. It's great to see you all here. We're going to open with a song, I Shall Know Him. When my life's work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, he's my Savior, first of all, is another, um, <coughs> another name for it. I don't know if you know this, but uh, my Savior, first of all, it says, I'll know him and redeemed by his side I'll stand. I love one of my favorite parts of this is that uh, Fanny Crosby was uh, blind when she wrote the song, so it's kind of a neat, a neat way to sing it when my life work is ended. Brother Jim, are you ready? Whenever you get a chance, we're in. All right. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. This rain slowed us all down this evening, didn't it? We're, we're, I thought I was going to be a solo act, but thankfully Lisa's up here, so there's a couple of us. You sing nice and loud to cover us up, okay? All right, here we go. Brother Jim? <laughs> My life's work is ended and I cross the swell and bright and glorious morning I shall see. I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side and this smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know, I shall know Him, I shall know And redeemed by His side I shall stand. I shall know Imagine in the sky, sing it out. I shall know him, I shall know him. And redeemed by his side, I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him. By the prince of nails in his hand. Oh, the dear ones in glory, how they beckon me to come. And how parting at the river I recall.
have a word of prayer, shall we, tonight as it begins. Brother Larry, would you mind opening us in a word of prayer? Thank you. You can take a break here, just sit down for a little while, but sing along with us, The Lord Is. Just one last song, if you'll stand with Before You I Kneel. I know you've sung this a few times, and when we introduce a song, we like to do it over uh, the course of a few weeks so you can enjoy it and get to know it, know it a little bit with us. And this one's by uh, the Getty family. I really enjoy it. It's called Before You I Kneel. Before you I kneel, my master and maker, to offer the work of my hands. For this is the day you've given your servant. I will rejoice and be glad. For 
for the strength I have to live and breathe, for each skill your grace has given me, for the needs and opportunities that glorify your great name. Before you I kneel and ask for your goodness to cover the work of my hands, for patience and peace to shape all my labor, your grace for thorns in my path. Flow within me like a living stream, wear away the stones of pride and greed, till your ways are dwelling deep in me, and the harvest of life is grown. For you we kneel, our master and maker, establish the work of our hands, and order our steps to seek first your kingdom. In every small and great task, may we live the gospel of your grace, and serve your purpose in our fleeting days. Then our lives will bring eternal praise and glory to your great name. And all glory to your great name. Amen. Well, thank you for worshiping together with us at this time. You can grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians 1, and we'll get resituated here. All right, I'm sure the teens are excited to get back to the youth group, so we're going to go ahead and dismiss them. I hope you have a great time, and we're praying that Brother West will be filled with the Spirit and they'll have a time that will honor the Lord. As we open our Bibles, we're going to turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 4, 2 Thessalonians 1, 4. All right. Wes has been preparing a message to preach here in our service as well. I was um, spending some time with him yesterday. We were going over it, so I'm pretty excited about what he has to bring to us in the near future. But tonight, uh, we're in 2 Thessalonians, so if you'll grab your Bible, we'll turn to chapter number 1, and as promised, we're going to talk about persecution tonight. I know that persecution is not the most popular subject in Christianity, certainly not the most encouraging one that we'll talk about um, in regards to our future, but I do want to take a few moments to cover the word as it comes to us, so line by line, precept by precept, as Paul tries to encourage this, the Thessalonian church. Again, uh, books, Thessalonians, Philippians, they're to the persecuted church, not to those that, um, that lived in ease or in wealth. <laughs> Somebody's back there just still singing. Praise the Lord. At least somebody still wants to sing when the music's over. Some people don't want to sing while it's going on. So we appreciate, we appreciate how uh, vigorous and excited he is about that. So we're going to begin in verse number 4. Let's do that together, shall we? 2 Thessalonians 1-4 So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Sound like we have some real persecution in the back there, but we'll try to hold on. All right. I'm not sure if he's being persecuted because he has to listen to me 
or I'm being persecuted because I had to listen to him, but we're trying, trying to figure it out. All right. I'm not sure where I was, but why don't we start in verse number 8. In the flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. When He shall come to be glorified in His saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of His calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power. And that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a mouthful, and I think I probably had to read it a dozen times to try to grasp all that he was saying. Luckily, we have an hour to kind of take this apart, um, and we will do that right after prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening that um, those so many have faithfully gathered here. We thank you for the rain today, Father. We pray um, that it wouldn't do too much damage to the crops. Um, and we ask, Father, that you would uh, be glorified in our message this evening and that you would just draw our hearts toward the persecuted church and toward a faith and patience that's required in difficult times. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know what they say, where the church is uh, quiet, um, there are no children, but the children are the life of the church, so we're glad that they're here. And uh, I don't get, I, I do get flustered, but not frustrated. <laughs> Someday I'm going, to be, I'm going to be like laser focused, but I'm still learning these lessons. As we begin in uh, 2 Thessalonians, I, I want to address one of the first issues that he's going to talk to the Thessalonians about. And this first issue is persecution. Persecution. As we talk about persecution today, I want to do a handful of things. First of all, we want to identify the encouraging words that Paul gives to the persecuted church. That's number one. Uh, number two... We want to talk about the end, God's ultimate punishment on the world. And lastly, um, as, as, we, as we kind of address that with, with hopefully um, some, some true understanding, I also want to bring out um, there's some real quality verses on salvation, on what, what it means to be saved, and how you'll feel when God comes back, and uh, what your actions have to do with that. And I think it's a really good um, point we'll get into that so why don't we begin in verse number four um, and before we do though I, I want to just uh, go over the realities of persecution in our day um, I've brought a little ex excerpt tonight from opendoorsusa.org I don't know if you're familiar with open doors you're probably familiar with like voice of the martyrs and uh, they're a similar organization but they take um, they essentially deal with statistics and just so that we can be reminded that in our day and age is a persecuted church, and someday that might include us, I thought it would be good to go over some of the persecution that has been recognized. For the report year of 2019, um, and the way that works is um, they took the statistics from 2017 in October to November in 2018. So they took a year's worth of stats, and that's what we get today. And every year those will be brought out, I'm assuming because there's COVID, we're not really, <laughs> we're lacking some of that info this year. But in 2017, 2018, which is not that long ago, they estimate that 245 million Christians live in the top 50 world watch list. Uh, on the, there, there's 50 countries on the world watch list and five, uh, 245 million people live in countries with significant persecution. Um, one in nine Christians, that doesn't sound like very much, 245 million, right? One in nine Christians live and experience high levels of persecution for their choice to follow Christ. Um, excuse me. They live um, in the highest levels of persecution. 14% is the rise of the number of Christians in the top 50 countries in the 2019 World Watch list. So one in nine Christians experience high levels of persecution, and that's up 14%. 4,136 Christians were killed for faith-related reasons in these top 50 countries. 
Again, not all over the world, just in the top 50 countries of persecute believers. 2,625 Christians have been detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned in these 50 countries. 1,266 churches or Christian buildings were attacked in the same 50 countries. Seven out of nine, that is, in seven of the countries in the world watch list, on the top ten, the primary cause of persecution is, is Islamic oppression. Which tells us two things, I think. Uh, one, that Islamic countries are among the greatest offenders in persecution, but also as Islam and that faith is on the rise, we can consider some persecution in the future. 11 countries in the extreme level for their persecution are scored. Um, North Korea is number one. For 18 consecutive years, North Korea has ranked the number one as the world's most dangerous place for Christians. All right, so let's, let's, that's what it means. That's an annual. Let's do by the month. Every month, 105 churches are attacked, burned, or vandalized in just these 50 countries. Every day, 11 Christians are killed for their faith in just 50 countries. By continent, one out of every six Christians in Africa will experience high levels of persecution. One out of three Christians in Asia will experience high levels of persecution. And just to give you some contrast, one out of 21 Christians in South America will experience high levels of persecution. So you imagine if you're a Christian, it's good, it's good to be a Christian in America. Not so good to be a Christian in South America, you really don't want to be a Christian in Africa or Asia. And actually, as I looked at the persecution map, I realized that not really that much has changed. The most persecuted areas on the globe are still right around the Middle East, where uh, Europe and Africa and Asia all uh, kind of join. As we're talking about persecution and the fact that it is alive and well today, it's important to acknowledge it always has been. Tertullian said this, If the Tiber rises too high or the Nile is too low, the remedy is always feeding Christians to the lions. And so at least we can be thankful in America that we don't have to live with that kind of issue. We know that persecution is real. It was real. And apparently it is real today. It's all over the world. So what can we learn from persecution? What does a Christian do with a verse about persecution, especially live in America? Um, I, I want to just uh, begin uh, with a couple of caveats. 1 Peter 4.15, we don't have to turn there necessarily, but I want to remind you that he said the persecution is not suffering, it's suffering for the gospel. He said that if you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer, or I like this next one, if you suffer as a busybody in somebody else's business, okay, that's not persecution. <laughs> so I think that's really important. Some people feel persecuted, but it's because they always get their nose in somebody else's business. This is what we're not talking about. We're not talking about people that just get themselves into trouble. We're talking about the kind of pushback, the kind of attack that you'll receive for your faith. Even though we don't experience possibly what they do in Africa, I think we've all been pursued in some minor way because of something that we believe is right. And so you can understand that as a measure, a small measure of persecution. What does the Christian do? How does he process persecution? What does the church as a whole learn from this principle? And what are the proofs we derive? Let's begin in verse number 4. It says here that Paul glories in the churches of God, in all of those churches, for the patience of the Thessalonians. I want to say this. Persecution is a great testimony. One thing that every church learns all through the world from the persecuted church is that we should and we can be faithful. How many of you, when you hear stories of persecution, you feel kind of ashamed? 
right? You feel kind of ashamed that you have it so easy for the Lord. And sometimes you complain about stuff that doesn't matter. I do this and get down in the dumps about nothing in the world. But Paul acknowledged that it's good for Christians to approach the subject of persecution as a way to glory in the Lord and what he's doing in the lives of faithful believers. The Thessalonians, like the Philippians, they were like a city set on a hill because of their persecution. And so Paul talked about them everywhere. The Christian church should not turn its head or its eyes from persecution. That's where I want to begin today. Don't avoid the topic because it's uncomfortable. Don't avoid the topic because it's uncomfortable. And Paul did not avoid it. Persecution was not something that Paul tried to hide from the churches of God. It was a reason for Paul to glory. Remember, we talked about these connections here in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. It says, rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. And actually, the word here that says, we glory in you in all the churches because of your persecutions and tribulations and because of your trials and suffering. That word glory also can be translated to rejoice. And so here is Paul teaching them, not only saying that you should rejoice in everything, but now he's in all the churches rejoicing. Christians, topics that are negative for the world, that are discouraging, they can be processed as encouraging for a Christian. And so I want to remind us today that as a church, it's not even though it's not always comfortable to talk about this side, it is important to remember the persecuted church so that we can rejoice in glory in the faith of our fellow believers around the world. And that's what Paul did here. He says that he glories in all the churches for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. So what do the persecutions teach us? It says this, which is a manifest token of, of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy. Let me begin, first of all, um, as we are opening, kind of opening up into what persecution means to us. Notice here, he says that persecution is a manifest token. Well, what does that mean? That's not really something that we would say. The word here, manifest token, means it's an indication, or God is showing us evidence, and some translations even say that. It means it's, it's a it's an evidence. It's a very real evidence. It's, it's, it's a visible evidence of the judgment of God, of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which also you suffer. So the Christian from persecution can understand better God's righteousness. And not only God's righteousness, but it says God's righteousness in judgment. The world may ask, there's all these good people. How could God judge this world? How is it? Have you ever heard that kind of an argument? There's how could God judge um, so many good people in the world? I'll tell you how he could judge them because of persecution. As the Christian approaches the topics of the talk about of God's judgment, we also need to acknowledge this: that you can't, the world can't just kill and destroy God's people. Um, throughout, and then expect to be let off the hook in the end. It shows us and teaches us that God's judgment is righteous. You know, if Christians never suffered, the world might well scratch their head. I wonder why God would judge us. But since it is clear today that God's children are not welcome in the world, that His ways are pursued, and they're met with with trials and death and imprisonments like we've just read, we're learning something that's real, right? God's judgment is not only apparent, but we can look at tribulations today and say it's righteous. It's righteous. Without persecution, the world does not have a visible example of God and His righteousness in judging us. As we talk about the righteous, the, the indication of the righteous judgment of God, I thought of it a couple different ways. I read some few commentaries. The first way is the way we've looked at it. That persecution teaches us that God's judgment is righteous, right? That, hey, you know, people are being, people, their heads are being chopped off for their faith. Christians are being drowned for their faith. 
We, some of you remember videos not long ago for Christians being put in cages and drowned for, for saying, they're not denying Jesus Christ. Well, the world doesn't understand why God is judging people. I think it's pretty clear why, right? It's pretty clear why. If, if America sent their ambassadors over to another country and they drowned them for being Americans, well, I mean... Hillary Clinton wouldn't do anything, but there are some people that might be pretty angry about that, right? Have wars been fought for less? Because representatives of, of, of nations are protected, right? Supposedly there's a, there's a huge problem with mistreating representation or representatives of nations' ambassadors. Isn't that exactly what's happening to Christians? God sent us into the world as ambassadors world destroys us then his judgment is righteous or at least it's an indication of god's righteousness that's the first way to look at it another way to look at it is this how can people expect god not to judge them if they are executing christians does the world not does the world not today do we not punish the viewpoints of those we don't agree with? I mean, isn't that happening all over? So don't we, don't we wouldn't expect the kind of same thing from the Lord. Uh, the Bible says this in Romans chapter number 3, right? Who are you that judges another man? Right? And then you do the same things. Isn't the world going, I can't believe that God would judge people. Will you let someone try to come kill your kids and see how judgmental you get all of a sudden? Right? That's a serious thing. We all recognize that in the world there are values and the most important values in the world they carry a penalty of death, right? And we've seen that over and over. How can man say God is unrighteous in his judgment if they are persecuting his children? He says here, I love this Next one, we not only see the righteousness of God in this kind of indicator, but it says that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Do you know, I was studying this word worthy. It occurs about 54 times in 52 verses throughout the New Testament. And if you take out those verses as God, out of the God is worthy verses, and if you take out um, the verses that talk about a worthy lifestyle, the vast majority of these verses about worthiness are related generally to persecution and some of you remember the very first disciples that preached about jesus were beaten and thrown in prison and as they said that they rejoiced because they were worthy to suffer for the kingdom of god and this is an enduring theme persecuted christians are worthy christians god sets them on a pedestal god puts them forth not as, well, well, the world might disdain them or belittle them. God puts them forth as worthy, as glorious. And he says here, for which you also suffer. And so this is a general truth that they know in a very personal way. So we have God's righteous judgment. He says, seeing then it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And this is what Christians need to see when they're being attacked. They need to see that this world is not all there is. He says it's a righteous thing for God to recompense tribulation to the people that trouble you. That means all those that are persecuted today, that doesn't happen without God's making it right in eternity. It says He will recompense or He'll reward or he'll make it right tribulation to them that trouble you. This is an interesting thing. To the Middle Eastern mind, it seems, or at least to the Christian mind in their day, the Greeks here possibly, when they looked at the disorder in the world, they actually saw the necessity of Christ coming, and it didn't disprove it. What's the number one question that we hear about disproving God? If God is real, then how can there be all this suffering in the world? You ever heard that question? This is an interesting thing. If you read the Bible, Paul actually said it a different way. He said, if there's all this suffering in the world, then God's coming has to be real. <laughs> I 
Because all things have to be brought into balance. And the only way that he could prove, and, and I thought it was kind of an interesting way, while the world tries to disprove God because of the sufferings of righteous people, Paul was proving God's coming, the reality of Christ's coming with it. He used it the opposite way. He said, hey, look, the world is so messed up. God has got to come back and change things because they have to be made right. And that's the way they were looking at the world. That's just one interesting kind of thought that today there are all these arguments that are kind of prevailing and a mentality that, that backs up those arguments. But they were, he's using a different proof. He, he goes from the other direction. He says, well, if, it, if, 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 if the world's so bad, then we definitely, we got to be looking for the coming of Christ from someone who will come and make all these things right, will make everything new, who will, who will wipe away the tears and who will revenge the pain. People that were dying and suffering in the world, they expected things to be made right. Matter of fact, they probably were even... I don't want to say the right words. They were probably even kind of combative toward God about it. Like, hey, what's the deal? This is not right. You ever said something like that? It's just not right. It's just not right. Isn't that, isn't that funny how humans beg for righteousness? Like in their soul and in their core. I would say that's not a proof against God. It's a proof for God. The world... And all these sins, they cannot be made right except by a God in a resurrection in eternity. Can't be made right in this world. We can't fix what's broken. We can't restore what is lost. And so the world, in, a, in essence, the, the, the world is groaning and travailing, like Romans said, and begging for God to come and make things right. And that's where we come into verse number 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And that's a reminder here. Persecution is guaranteed how long? Until he comes back. Remember we talked about Thessalonians is all about the coming of the Lord. He reminded them that persecution wasn't intended. It's not going to end until Jesus comes back. It's the Christian's uh, it seems the Christianity's closest friend. It says, in, and then as, we, as we're talking about this persecution and God's righteousness, the Lord's going to make it right, I stumbled upon a kind of truth I didn't expect, and that was there's, there's, there's a reality here about how people get saved and how we know God and how God's judgment is reckoned. You know, some people today, some Christians even, are still reckoning salvation by works, aren't they? By what we do. But listen to these next verses. And a flaming fire taking vengeance on them that what? That know not God. You know, the Bible is very clear who God's going to judge. Who are they? Those are the ones who don't know God. Wait a minute. Are they only the ones that persecute the church? Those that know, those that know not God and what? And obey not the Ten Commandments. No. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is, this is the message of salvation, all encapsulated in this conversation on persecution. You know who God judges? Those that don't know him and those that don't, don't obey the gospel. What's the gospel? Is it not salvation through Jesus Christ? By faith, right? By grace. And so this again, while all this persecution is going on and God talks about his wrath and the fire of his vengeance, there is an escape, isn't there? There's two, there's, there's two uh, aspects of this escape. Knowing God and obeying the gospel. Knowing God and obeying the gospel. And I would say to obey the gospel is to ultimately know God. That's why, and again, we have asked this question. You remember the story about the men that came before God and said, Oh, Lord, we cast out devils in your name. And we did all these great things in your name. And he said, Depart from me, I never what? knew you what's the problem man that's scary is it possible that i could get saved and then someday god won't know me no because see what it wasn't about obeying the gospel to them it was about doing great things for god or doing works for the lord and this is very clear it's interesting that we often talk about salvation and we combat works to salvation from some of the positive verses how about from this negative one this may be one of the greatest proof texts for salvation 
and how you receive it in the Bible. He says he's going to take vengeance on who? On those that don't know God and those that don't obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a clear indicator of salvation from the negative, right? Omit what and you go to hell. Omit the gospel of Jesus and the knowledge of God. It says here that they will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. This is something I think, as he talks about persecution, he gives them some encouragement. The first encouragement is that they are an example to the church. They're encouraging the whole church. The second acknowledgement that he makes is that God is going to make all things right. God is going to make all things right. The third acknowledgement here is that God is going to punish with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. We should ask this question. Is it okay for Christians to preach about hellfire and damnation if they're not willing to endure persecution? See, this is something I think is very important as we read about this in this passage. I think what he's teaching them is this. Look, you should be willing to suffer for a little while on this earth because those are persecuting you. They're going to be suffering for all eternity. Is that not a good concept? It's not okay to, to, to thrash the world with hell and all the, all the bad stuff if you're not willing to suffer for God. And I think that's one of the messages here. That is, they're talking about what it means to be a church that has tried, that has suffered. He says, look, this suffering is okay, but it's okay because we know God's going to make it right, that He's going to punish evildoers. But what kind of a Christian says, God, how can you possibly persecute me for these few minutes on this earth in my short life, but then thinks it's okay to punish everybody for eternity in hell that doesn't believe on God? Do you see? See how that's, I think, I think what he's teaching them is this. It's not only an example to the church. It's, it's also a symbol of the righteousness of God. As Christians, don't be quick to condemn people, but not to suffer yourself. I think that's kind of alluded to here in the scriptures. It says, and again, as we talk about this, I'm, I'm just going to take leave here from persecution to talk about the gospel. We know now that to avoid eternal punishment and judgment, you need only know the Lord and obey the gospel of Jesus. That is what? Call upon the name of the Lord, believe, and you shall be saved. Notice here, another thing that he wants us to realize is this, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction, and here's the words, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. This also gives us a special, okay, I don't want to say this right, this gives us a special insight into what hell is. He says his eternal destruction is what? To be put out from his presence. To be put out from his presence. It says from the presence. In some translations even say it this way. They actually say to be put away from his presence. And that's the reality here again. I've talked about hell many times before with you. And here it's reiterated again. The concept that hell is... Fire is not the part of hell that you should be worried about. It's being separated from the presence of God. See, God is an eternal fire, isn't He? It says in flaming fire He takes vengeance. But what is the eternal destruction? To be away from the presence of God. To be away from the presence of God. And from the glory of His power. How many people know hell on earth because they are not experiencing the light of His presence? Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power? So what is this punishment? It's punishment from His presence and punishment from His power. How do we live and breathe? By the power of God. How do all things exist? 
and continue by the power of God. So the eternal destruction is to do what? To be separated from, from God, from, from His presence, and to be separated from His power. Many Christians today know what it's like. I want to say, not Christians, many world people in the world today, many persons in the world today, they know what it's like to be separated, right, from God's presence per se, but not from His power, because they're still filling the light of the sun, the beat of their heart, hearing the sound of creation. They got no idea what it would be like to be away from God. When he shall become to be glorified with all of his saints. Let's talk about this a little bit because I think one of the things that we need to learn from the scriptures is that being separated from God's presence is a continual choice. Look at Isaiah chapter 2 and verse number 10. Isaiah 2.10, as we cruise through the scriptures, I want to take a few moments to talk about eternal punishment because eternal punishment was the encouragement in times of persecution. Some of you remember in Revelation, there were many souls of those that were beheaded and tortured and killed for the cause of Christ. And it said they cried out for justice. And God said, you have to wait. Not a, they haven't killed everybody that needs to be killed in the tribulation. They haven't, their, their sin is not full yet. But he says, when it is, then I'll, punishment, I'll punish them. And it'll be a righteous punishment. Look at Isaiah chapter 2 and verse number 10. Isaiah 2.10. It says, enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. Look at verse number 19. It says, they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly at the earth. Turn to Revelation 6.16. Revelation 6.16. Again, a reminder, it's not really a sermon about my pleasure in the judgment of God on people. You know, we, we know that there have been actually persecutors of the church that have been saved. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Revelation 6.16 says this, which is, by the way, it's the fulfillment of the prophecy from Isaiah. It says, and they said to the mountains and to the rocks, what? Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? See, what happens in the end is when God's glory shines forth to the believer, that light is warm, that fire is glorious. It means honor and glory and power, right? We admire it, but not to the unbeliever. To the unbeliever, the presence of God is so repugnant. It's so against their nature and their desire that they don't go toward the light, they go away from the light. You know what a great example of that is? One of my favorite examples of what I believe God is like to the believer and unbeliever is in Exodus. Do you remember the book of Exodus? The, remember the Israelites, they go out of Egypt and, they're, and they get to the Red Sea and Pharaoh decides he doesn't want to let them go anymore. What does he do? He sends the chariots after him. And the Bible said that God, he put a wall between them, didn't he? His presence went between them. And it was, to the Israelites, it was, like a, it was like a light, a lamp at night. But to the Egyptians, it was total darkness. I believe that's a lot like what eternity is going to be. That those that receive Jesus Christ in the Spirit To them, God's presence will be warmth and light and wonder. But to those that don't receive Jesus, that same presence will be terror and darkness. That's important. Because then it really comes down, it's really not how God sees you that's the problem, is it? It's how you're deciding to see God. See, God places the continual decision on humankind. You know in the very last day, when God showed up to judge the world, they didn't go, oh, good, God's here. We want you, God, please. What did they say? Get us out of here. Matter of fact, I was reading Revelation today, and it said that over and over as God's presence was revealed, it said they didn't repent. It said they blasphemed. And then they blasphemed again. And then they blasphemed all the more, and they would not repent. And that's what happens. As God's glory shone on the earth, Christians were like, yes! And unbelievers were like, let's go to the rocks. 
And so it's, there's, a, there's a defined decision here. And this is how Christians were encouraged in their day. He talks about the coming of the Lord with the persecuted church. And it gives them that they're looking for that light. They're looking for that hope of His coming. How foreign is that to the American? As we try everything we can possibly to escape death in meeting with our Lord, right? Oh man, I'm not healthy. I better get some pills. I don't want to die. <laughs> but they're the persecuted church. Again, it's not life they're hoping for. It's the new life in Jesus Christ, His coming. And so that's why I think it's so important as we read, as we read 2 Thessalonians to see that they're a persecuted church because it, it really explains, doesn't it, why Paul has to talk about the coming of Jesus on every page. Because they are just dying to meet Christ, literally, in persecutions, in suffering. And the Bible says, in tribulations, the word persecute means to pursue. Tribulation means to afflict. In other words, they were both being pursued and tortured for the cause of Jesus Christ. It helps you to understand a little bit better, I think, it helps me to understand a little bit better what they're like. Look at Luke 16, 25. Luke 16, 25. As we talk about God's righteous act in condemning those that reject Him and receiving those that receive Him. Luke 16, 25 says this, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime didst receive good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. And now he is comforted, and you are tormented. So those that live by the world system, right, that get good for themselves in this world, not by the grace of God or by their faith in Jesus Christ, but by the, merit, the meritorious system, right, where the, the credit and debit kind of a system, they're going to have good in this life, but what are they going to have in the next? The only way to avoid this kind of issue is to get out of the system altogether, right? To get out of the conventional banking system of the world's mentality and you need to place your faith in Jesus Christ. Don't reckon your salvation by merit, but by faith. It says here, and I think again, this is what he's talking about, God's righteous judgment, right? He's talking about God's, he's, he's trying to prove that God is just. And this is an argument too, I want to remind Christians, this is an argument you need to make. You need to learn to tell unbelievers why God's judgment is okay. That's an argument that Jesus endeavored to make, and it's an argument that Paul endeavored to make. The world says, we don't believe in hell. I can't believe it. How could you possibly believe in hell? Well, here's a great argument for it. He says this, as long as you're on the system of the merit, here's Lazarus who's rejected and despised and eating the scraps from the table of the rich man, no mercy, no grace, no medical help from this rich individual. Then they get to hell and he says, wait, wait, wait. Now you're tormented and he's comforted. You tell me what the problem with that is. Notice at this point, the rich man ceases to, I mean, you don't hear any kind of justification, do you? Oh, I was righteous. I don't know why I'm down here. None of that happens in hell, does it? This is something very important. Nobody will be condemned to hell that does not acknowledge and recognize that they deserve to go there. It says here that even the rich man, as we read, he makes no cries. I was righteous. I was godly. Why am I here? Is that what he says? No, he says, please, please, just a little bit of mercy, right? Cool my tongue. Make Lazarus go and tell my brothers. He didn't say, you're wrong, God. He said, I'm wrong, but somebody better go tell somebody or we're in trouble right? That mentality we believe carries in hell. The Christian does not teach that people will be surprised when they end up there. As God gets closer and closer, as creation reveals more and more of this truth, they will reject again and again and again. And God's judgment will be just. God's judgment will be just. Let's go back um, to our text here in 2 Thessalonians. <clears throat> And as we do that, um, we put our finger there, and then we're going to move a little bit through the Word. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. Let's see if I can find it. All right. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're talking about the judgment of God. 
the Christian that is persecuted, the coming of Christ, the judgment of the world, the making right of all things is a great encouragement. To the believer who looks on, the persecuted Christian is a great example and encouragement. All are likewise encouraged by persecution and in persecution. It says, and when he shall come, look at verse number 10. We just talked about his presence and his power and the punishment of everlasting. Verse number 10, when he shall come to be what? And to do what? To be admired. So to be glorified, admired. That's why Jesus is coming, to be glorified and to be admired by all his saints, by all them that believe because of our... And there's another proof text of what does it mean to be saved? Do we get saved by works? How did these people get saved? Believe. It says it right there. By faith. He says, he's going to be admired in all those that what? Believe. Boy, I, can't, I don't know if I've ever seen a more ironclad argument for faith that saves us than you do in 2 Thessalonians. And we hear it in a little different way, don't we? Because our testimony among you was what? Boy, I don't know. Maybe we should say this again. He says this. And to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was what? Believed. It sounds like maybe believing, right? Maybe that's the way we get to heaven, by believing the Lord, by knowing God. He says, wherefore, oh, excuse me. In verse number 11, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all good pleasure of his goodness in the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I like that kind of, this is the in you and you in him. I like, this is a continual truth throughout the Bible. God is glorified when Christians are persecuted. He's glorified in their lives. But then in eternity, they will be glorified in Jesus, won't they? So God will be glorified in them. They will be glorified in Him. Let's look again. Last slide, as we talk about persecution, I want to take just a moment to remind everyone that persecution is uh, something that Paul was a part of. And that this idea of worthiness is always tied to persecution. Remember Paul said in Corinthians, what did he say? He said that I'm, it's not meat that I should be called an apostle. It's not, it's not fitting that I should be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. And this is one of those things that the scripture ties to persecution. Worthiness. Worth. Value. Glory. Those are all words that God says whenever a Christian's suffering. Those are words that we would rightly remember the next time someone attacks you or attacks somebody you love. It shows that they're worthy. That God is righteous. Let's look at Revelation 16, 4 and 5 and then we'll close. I didn't realize the hour's already upon us. Revelation 16, 4 and 5. Again, not only will men recognize the righteousness of God, but also the world, the angels. Look what it says here. 16, 4 and 5 of Revelation. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the waters and the fountains of the waters, and they became what? Blood. There's a, again, Revelation is filled with the same plagues that we saw in Egypt, isn't it? Because God's judgment doesn't change, does it? And that's something really important. It's not like mankind has never seen what God's going to do in Revelation. It's just there, man continues to sin, and they saw what it did to Egypt, and now they're going to see what it does again, aren't they? But look what happens. This is kind of fascinating. It says, as we talk about the righteousness of God, and I heard the angels of the waters say what? Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and which wast, it which shall be, because thou hast judged thus. You see what happened? Here's why. Verse number six, for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and thou hast given them the blood to drink, for they are worthy. Well, that's kind of a kind of a pointed statement, isn't it? God, again, not apologetic. People not disagreeing. Angels not disagreeing with God's judgment. 
They look at the world, and when the, when the waters will someday turn to blood in the chapters of Revelation, the angel of the waters, he says, oh, that's a, that's a just judgment. That's righteous, God, because they shed the blood of believers, and now they have to drink it. That's pretty strong words, but very true, and they show the righteousness of God. The truth of his vengeance, the justice of his punishment on the world. And it said in verse number 7, And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And that's what the persecuted Christian can count on, right? That God's going to make everything right. That's what the suffering Christian can count on. That God's going to make everything right. It's not fair. It's not just. It's not right. Some of us are looking at our own government and we're saying, that's not right. Right? That's not right. What's happening today is not right. And we're seeing people being punished that shouldn't be punished and some that should be punished that aren't being punished. We're saying, what's going on with our country? It's, it's going down the, down the tubes. That's not right. Right? We're seeing all that stuff. God's going to make it right. God's going to make it right. Remember, we Christians, we look for another city, right? We look for another country, not made with hands, but whose builder and maker is God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this um, evening, and certainly we pray that we would have used it for your glory in the best way possible. We pray now for the persecuted church around the world, for our friends in Africa and Asia, and Lord, our friends in South America who are in suffering intense persecution. And no doubt, Lord, there's even people in countries where there shouldn't be persecution, where they are being persecuted. We're maybe a Christian in a, in a wonderful country with a neighbor that's, <clears throat> that has persecuted him or a friend that has burned a church or attacked. Um, help us, Lord, uh, to see these persecutions and to remember what really matters, what really is gonna, how you're going to make everything right, what's really important in the end. We pray, Lord, that even the persecutors of the church today, like Paul, would come to see that Jesus Christ, through faith, through grace, could save them from that sin and make them one of his children. Lord, we say, even come quickly, that the persecuted church is teaching us that Thessal the Thessalonians are teaching us, and Paul in his sufferings teach, are, is teaching us that we shouldn't be so, so at home in this world, so content with what we have here, but we should be thinking in eternal realities. Lord, we should be hoping for the coming. The world hides from you. The world doesn't want to go on to be with you, but as believers, we should be excited. Excited not only about death from persecution, but even as we give up this body for a new one, Lord, just help us to always be encouraged and in the right mind to receive these words. Again, we'll pray, Lord, that as we go out this week, we can be a blessing uh, to your name. We pray that you would, uh, you would walk with each individual. You give us the wisdom that's necessary and the words to reach our friends and neighbors. We pray for these who've come tonight, that you would bless them, that you would multiply their hours that they have left. I know that they've given a great deal of their weekend for you. And that everything we could possibly give is nothing to your glory. But we just pray, Lord, that you'd help us to, to be uh, still effective in each of our lives. And, and Lord, tonight as we're closing in prayer, we want to remember those that are not well. Um, these prayer requests we were shared on Wednesday, remember the Warden family, all John's brothers, and those um, three that are uh, just not well in the hospital. We lift them up, each of them with their own ailments. We pray for the family and for... Um, your spirit to be very active in their lives. And we also lift up uh, Judy Huffman, her husband and brother, both, Lord, um, unwell and in a very precarious position now, Lord. We pray that you give her the strength and that you would um, bring healing into their lives and your will will be done in those situations in Jesus' name, amen. All right, Lord bless you as we're closed. It was good to see you all today. Um, don't forget, uh, next, next couple weeks here, we're going to be seeing... On Mother's Day, we're going to be having a missionary. So you guys check your bulletins. Kind of keep up to date. If you're a gentleman, two men have come and registered for Master's Men. If, you're, if you want to go to Master's Men, that's that big preaching conference we go to every year on the 14th and 15th. I need to, I need to know about that. You just let me know you're registering. 
They've been asking me, how do we register? Make your checks payable to Kathy Zolli Baptist Church. Master's Men has asked that we write them one check from the church. So if you'll let me know um, this week, I'll, put your, I'll register your name um, with Master's Men, and I will, the church will take those, and he'll make all that one payment to them, and that simplifies their books, and that'll be very helpful, all right? God bless you. Have a, have a wonderful evening.